Hello everyone, welcome back to Storytime with Belle. I know you are all as disappointed as I was with chapter 4. It was only a single page. But I suppose it is better than having to listen to 107 pages of curtsying, tea pouring, and crazy medicines created by Miracle Men. But now we are on to the next chapter, and I'm waiting for that adventure we were promised. So here we are. The Princess Bride, Chapter 5, The Announcement. The great square of Florin City was filled as never before, awaiting the introduction of Prince Humperdinck's bride-to-be, Princess Buttercup of Hammersmith. The crowd had begun forming some 40 hours earlier, but up to 24 hours before, there were still fewer than 1,000. But then, as the moment of introduction grew nearer from across the sick country, people came. None had ever seen the princess, but rumors of her beauty were continual, and each was less likely than possible than the one before. At noontime, Prince Humperdinck appeared in the balcony of his father's castle and raised his arms. The crowd, which by now was at the danger size, slowly quieted. There were stories that the king was dying, that he was already dead, that he had long since, that he had been dead long since, that he was fine. My people, my beloveds, from whom we draw our strength, today is a day of greeting. As you must have heard, my honored father's health is not what it once was. He is, of course, 97. So who can ask for more? As you know, Florin needs a male heir. The crowd began to stir now. This had to be, it had to be, it was to be this lady they had heard so much about. In three months, our country celebrates its 500th anniversary. To celebrate that celebration, I shall, on that sundown, take for my wife the Princess Buttercup of Hammersmith. You do not know her yet, but you will meet her now. And he made a sweeping gesture, the balcony door swung open, and Buttercup moved out beside him on the balcony. The crowd quite literally gasped. The 21-year-old princess far surpassed the 18-year-old mourner. Her figure faults were gone, the two bony Ebo having flushed out nicely. The opposite pudgy wrist could not have been trimmer. Her hair, which was once the color of autumn, was still the color of autumn, except that before she attended it herself. Whereas now, she had five full-time hairdressers who managed things for her. This was long after hairdressers. In truth, Ever since there have been women, there have been hairdressers, Adam being the first, though the King James scholars do their very best to muddy this point. Her skin was still wintry cream, but now, with two handmaidens assigned to each appendage and four for the rest of her, and it actually, in certain lights, seemed to provide her with a gentle, continual moving as she moved glow. Prince Humperdinck took her hand and held it high, and the crowd cheered. That's enough. Mustn't risk overexposure, the prince said, and he started back to in toward the castle. They have waited, some of them, so long, Buttercup answered. I would like to walk among them. We do not walk among commoners, commoners unless it is unavoidable, the prince said. I have known more than a few commoners in my life, in my time. Prince Buttercup told him. They will not, I think, harm me. And with that, she left the balcony, reappeared a moment later at the great steps of the castle, and quite alone, walked open arm down into the crowd. Wherever she went, the people parted. She crossed and recrossed the great square, and always ahead of her, the people swept apart to let her pass. Buttercup continued moving slowly and smiling alone, like some land messiah. Most of the people would never forget that day. None of them, of course, had ever been so close to perfection, and the great majority adored her instantly. There were, to be sure, some who, while admittingly she was pleasing enough, were withholding judgment as to her quality as a queen. And, of course, there were some who were 
frankly jealous. Very few of them hated her, and only three of them were planning to murder her. But her cup naturally knew none of this. She was smiling. And when people wanted to touch her gown, well, let them. And when they wanted to brush their skin against hers, well, let them do that too. She had studied hard to do things royally, and she wanted very much to succeed. So she kept her posture erect and her smile gentle. And her death, that her death was so close would have only made her laugh if someone had told her. But in the farthest corner of the great square, in the highest building in the land, Deep in the deepest shadow, the man in black stood waiting. His boots were black and leather, his pants were black and his shirt. His mask was black, blacker than raven, but blackest of all were his flashing eyes. Flashing and cruel and deadly. Buttercup was more than a little weary from her triumph. After her triumph, the touching of the crowds had exhausted her, so she rested a bit. And then, toward mid-afternoon, she changed into her riding clothes and went to fetch horse. This was the one aspect of her life that had not changed in the years preceding. She still loved to ride, and every afternoon, whether permitting or not, she rode alone for several hours in the wild land beyond the castle. She did her best thinking then. Not that her best thinking ever expanded horizons. Still, she told herself, she was not a dummy either. So as long as she kept her thoughts to herself, well, where was the harm? As she rode through the woods and streams and heather, her brain was a whirl. The walk through the crowds had moved her in a way most strange. For even though she had done nothing for three years now but trained to be a princess and a queen, today was the de first day she actually understood it was all soon to be a reality. I don't like Cumberdink, she thought. It's not that I hate him or anything. I just never see him. He's always off someplace or playing in the zoo of death. To Buttercup's way of thinking, there were two main problems. One, was it wrong to marry without like? And two, if it was, was it too late to do anything about it? The answer to her ways of thinking as she rode along were one, no, and two, yes. It wasn't wrong to marry someone you didn't like. It just wasn't right, either. If the whole world didn't, it wouldn't be so great. What with everybody kind of grunting at everybody else as the years went by. But of course, not everybody did it, so forget about that. The answer to two was even easier. If she had, she had given her word, she would marry. That would have to be enough. True. He had told her quite honestly that if she had said no, he would have to have her disposed of in order to keep the respect of the crown at its proper level. Still, she could have, had she chosen, said no. Everybody, Everyone had told her, since she became a princess in training, that she was very likely the most beautiful woman in the world. Now she was going to be the richest and most powerful as well. Don't expect too much from life, Buttercup told herself as she rode along. Learn to be satisfied with what you have. But it's such a sad thing to think about, isn't it? Always expect more, always want the best. I know I do. Dusk was closing in when Buttercup crested the hill. She was perhaps half an hour from the castle, and her daily ride was three quarters done. Suddenly she reined horse. Standing in the dimness beyond the was the strangest trio she had ever seen. The man in front was dark, Sicilian perhaps, with the gentlest face and most angelic eyes. Oh, most, sorry, with the most with the gentle, with the gentlest face, almost angelic. He was one leg too short in the making of a makings of a humpback, but he moved forward toward her with surprising speed and nimbleness. The other two remained rooted. The second, also dark, probably Spanish, was as erect and slender as the blade of steel that was attached to his side. The third man, mustachioed, perhaps a Turk, was easily the biggest human being she had ever seen. A word, the Sicilian said, raising his arms. His smile was more angelic than his face. Buttercup halted. Speak. 
We are but poor circus performers, the Sicilian explained. It is dark and we are lost. We were told there was a village nearby that might enjoy our skills. You are misinformed, Buttercup told him. There is no one, not for many miles. Then there will be no one to hear you scream, the Sicilian said. And he jumped with frightening agility toward her face. That was all Buttercup remembered. Perhaps she did scream. But as she did, it was more from terror than anything else, because there certainly was no pain. His hands expertly touched places on her neck, and unconsciousness came. She awoke to the lapping of water. Her, she was wrapped in a blanket, and a giant Turk was putting her in the bottom of a boat. For a moment, she was about to talk, but when they began talking, she thought it better to listen. And after she had listened for a moment, it got harder and harder to hear because of the terrible pounding of her heart. I think you should kill her now, the Turk said. The less you think, the happier I'll be, the, S S the Sicilian answered. There's the sound of ripping cloth. What is that? The Spaniard asked. The same as I attached to her saddle, the Sicilian replied. Fabric from the uniform of an officer of Gilder. I still think, the Turk began. She must be found dead on the Gilder frontier, or we will not be paid the remainder of our fee. Is that clear enough for you? I just feel better when I know what's going on, that's all, the Turk mumbled. People are always thinking I'm so stupid because I'm big and strong, and sometimes drool when I get a little when I get excited. The reason people think you're so stupid, the Sicilian said, is because you are so stupid. It has nothing to do with your drooling. There came the sound of a flapping sail. Watch your heads, the Spaniard cautioned. And then the boat was moving. The people of Florin will not take her death well, I, I, don't, I shouldn't think. She has become beloved. There will be war, the Sicilian agreed. We have been, pay, have been paid to start it. Start it. It's a fine line of work to be expert in. If we do this perfectly, there will be a continual demand for our services. Well, I don't like it all that much, the Spaniard said. Frankly, I wish you had refused. The offer was too high. I don't like killing girls. Sorry, I don't like killing a girl, the Spaniard said. God does it all the time. If it doesn't bother him, don't let it bother you. Don't let it worry you. Through all this, Buttercup had not moved. The Spaniard said, Let's just tell her we're taking her away for a ransom. The Turk agreed. She's so beautiful, and she'll go all crazy if she knew. She already knows, the Sicilian said. She's been awake for every word of this. But I could lay under the blanket, not moving. How could he have known that, she wondered. How can you be sure, the Spaniard asked. The Sicilian senses all, the Sicilian said. Conceited, Buttercup thought. Yes, very conceited, the Sicilian had said. He must be a mind reader, Buttercup thought. Are you giving it full sail? The Sicilian had said. As much as is safe, the Spaniard answered from the tiller. We have an hour on them, so no risks yet. It will take her horse perhaps 27 minutes to reach the castle, a few minutes for them to figure out what happened, and since we left an obvious trail, they should be after us within an hour. We should reach the cliffs in 15 minutes more, and with any luck at all, the Gilder Frontier at dawn when she dies. Her body should be quite warm when the prince reaches her mutilated form. I only wish we could stay for his grief. It should be, quite, be Homeric. Why does he let me know his plans? Buttercup wondered. You're going back to sleep now, my lady, the Spaniard said, and his fingers were suddenly touching her temple, her shoulder, her neck, and she was unconscious again. Buttercup did not know how long she was out, but they were still on the boat when she blinked, the blanket shielding her. And this time, without daring to think, the Sicilian would have known it somehow. She threw the blanket aside and dove deep into the floor and channel. She stayed under for as long as she dared, and then surfaced, starting to swim across the moonless water. 
that every ounce of strength remained to her. Behind her in the darkness there were cries. Go in! Go in from the Sicilian! I only dog paddle from the Turk. You're better than I am, from the Spaniard. But her cup continued to leave them behind. Her arms ached from effort, but she gave them no rest. Her legs kicked and her heart pounded. I can hear her kicking, the Sicilian said. Veer left! Buttercup went to her breaststroke, silently swimming away. Where is she? shrieked the Sicilian. The sharks will get her, don't worry, cautioned the Spaniard. Oh, wish, oh dear. I wish you hadn't mentioned that, thought Buttercup. Princess, the Sicilian called. Do you know what happens to sharks when they smell blood and water? They go mad. There is no control in their wildness. They rip and tread and chew and devour. And I'm in a boat, princess. And there isn't any blood in the water now, so we're both quite safe. But there is a knife in my hand. My lady, and if you don't come back, I will cut my arms. And I will cut my legs. And I'll catch the blood in the cup. And I'll fling it as far as I can and the sharks can smell blood and water for miles and you won't be beautiful for long. Buttercup hesitated, silently treading water. Around her now, although it was surely her imagination, she seemed to be hearing the swish of giant tails. Come back and come back now. There will be no other warning. Buttercup thought, if I come back now, they'll kill me anyway, so what's the difference? The difference is that he goes uh, doing that again, thought Buttercup. He really is a mind reader. If you come back now, the Sicilian went on, I give you my word as a gentleman and assassin that you will die totally without pain. I assure you will not get such a promise from the shark. Sorry, I assure you we'll get no such promise from the sharks. The fish sounds in the night grew loud, closer now. Buttercup began to tremble in fear. She was terribly ashamed of herself, but there it was. She only wished she could see for a minute if there really were sharks and if he would really cut himself. The Sicilian winced out loud. He just cut his arm, lady! The Turk called out. He's catching blood in the cup now. There must be half an inch of blood on the bottom. The Sicilian winced again. He cut his leg this time, the Turk went on. The cup's getting full. I don't believe them, Buttercup thought. There are no sharks in the water, and there is no blood in his cup. My arm is back to throw, the Sicilian called, said. Call out your location, or not. The choice is yours. I'm not making a peep, Buttercup decided. Farewell, from the Sicilian. There was the splash of sound... The, pl the splashing sound of liquid landing on liquid. Then there came a pause. Then the sharks went mad. <laughs> You're right, that is not the end of chapter five. Then the sharks went mad. All around her, Buttercup could hear them beeping and screaming and thrashing their mighty tails. Nothing can save me, Buttercup realized. I'm a dead cookie. I... I can't tell you what a dead cookie is. I'm sorry. Fortunately, for all concerned, save the sharks. It was around this time that the moon came out. There she is! The shouted the Sicilian. And like lightning, the Spaniard turned the boat. And as the boat drew closer, the Turk reached out a giant arm. And then she was back in the safety of her murderers. While all around them, sharks bumped into each other in wild frustration. Keep her warm! The Spaniard said from the tiller, tossing his cloak to the Turk. Don't catch, a co don't catch cold, the Turk said, wrapping Buttercup in the cloak's folds. It doesn't seem to matter all that much, she answered, seeing you're killing me at dawn. I'll do the actual work, the Turk said, indicating the Sicilian, who was wrapping cloth around his cuts. We'll just hold you. Hold your stupid tongue, the Sicilian commanded. I don't think he's so stupid. The, the Turk immediately hushed. I don't think he's so stupid, Buttercup said. And I don't think you're so smart either, with all your throwing blood and water. And all I... That's not what I call grade A thinking. It worked, didn't it? You're back, aren't you? The Sicilian crossed toward her. 
Once women are sufficiently frightened, they scream. But I didn't scream. The moon came out, answered Buttercup, somewhat triumphantly. The Sicilian struck her. That, enough of that, the Turk said. The tiny humpback looked dead at the giant. Do you want to fight me? I don't think you do. No, sir, the Turk mumbled. No. But don't use force. Please, force is mine. Strike me if you feel the need. I won't care. The Sicilian returned to the other side of the boat. She would have screamed, he said. She was about to cry out. My plan was ideal, as all my plans are ideal. It was the moon's ill timing that robbed me of perfection. He scowled unforgivingly at the yellow wedge between, above them. Then he stared ahead. There! The Sicilian pointed. The cliffs of insanity. And they were there. And there they were. Rising straight and sheer from the water a thousand feet into the night. They provided the most direct route between Florin and Gilder, but no one ever used them, sailing instead the long way many miles around. Not that the cliffs were impossible to scale. Two men were known to have climbed them in the last century, century alone. Sail straight for the steepest part, the Sicilian commanded. The Spaniard said, I was. Buttercup did not understand. Going up the cliffs could hardly be done, she thought. No one had ever mentioned secret passages, and no one had ever mentioned secret passages through them. Yet here they were, sailing closer and closer to the mighty rocks, now surely less than a quarter mile away. The first time, the Sicilian allowed himself a smile. All is well. I was afraid your little jaunt in the water was going to cost me too much time. I was allowed an hour for... I had allowed an hour of safety. There must still be fifty minutes of it left. We are miles ahead of anybody and safe, safe, safe. No one could be following us yet? The Spaniard asked. No one, the Sicilian assured him. It would be inconceivable. Absolutely inconceivable? Absolutely, totally, and in all other ways inconceivable, the Sicilian assured him, reassured him. Why do you ask? No reason, the Spaniard replied. It's only that I happened to look back, and something's there. They all whirled. Something was indeed there. Less than a mile behind them in the moonlight was another sailing boat. Small, painted what looked like black, with a giant sail that billowed black in the night, and a single man at the tiller. A man in black. The Spaniard looked at the Sicilian. It must just be a local fisherman out for a pleasure, pleasure cruise alone at night through shark-infested waters. There is probably a more logical explanation, the Sicilian, Sicilian said. But since no one in Gilder could know yet what we've done, and no one in Florin could have gotten here so quickly, he is definitely not, however much it may look like, follow, look like it following us. It is coincidence, and nothing more. He's gaining on us, the Turk said. That is also inconceivable, the Turk said. Before I stole this boat we're in, I made many inquiries as to what was the fastest ship in all of Florin Channel, and everyone agreed it was this one. He's still, he's gaining on us. Sorry. You're right, the Turk agreed, star staring back. He isn't gaining on us. He's just getting closer, that's all. It's the angle we're looking from, and nothing more, said the Sicilian. But our cup could not take her eyes from the great black sail. Surely the three men she was with frightened her. But somehow, for reasons she could never begin to explain, the man in black frightened her more. All right, look sharp, the Sicilian said then, just a drop of edginess in his voice. The cliffs of insanity were very close now. The Spaniard maneuvered the craft expertly, which was not easy, and the waves were rolling in toward the rocks now, and the spray was blinding. Buttercup shielded her eyes and put her head straight back, staring into the darkness toward the top, which, seem, which seemed shrouded and out of reach. But then the humpback, bound, humpback bounded forward, and the ship reached the cliff face. He jumped up, 
and suddenly there was a rope in his hand. Buttercup stared in silent astonishment. The rope, thick and strong, seemed to travel all the way up the cliffs. As she watched, the Sicilian pulled at the rope again, and again, and it held firm. It was attached to something at the top. A giant rock, a towering tree, something. Fast now, the Sicilian ordered, if he is following us, which of course is not within the realm of human experience, but if he is, we've got to reach the top and cut the rope off before he can climb up after us. Climb? Buttercup said. I would never be able to. Hush! The Sicilian ordered her. Get ready, he ordered the Spaniard. Sink it, he ordered the Turk. Then everyone got busy. The Spaniard took a rope, tied Buttercup's hands and feet. The Turk raised a giant leg and stomped in the center of the boat, which gave way immediately and began to sink. Then the Turk went to the rope and took it in his hands. Load me, the Turk said. The Spaniard lifted Buttercup and draped her body around the Turk's shoulders, and he tied himself to the Turk's waist. Then the Sicilian hopped, clung to the, and clung to the Turk's neck. All aboard, the Sicilian said. This was before trains, but the expression came, comes originally from carpenters loading lumber, and this was well after the carpenters. With that, the Turk began to climb. It was at least a thousand feet, and he was carrying the three, but he was not worried. When it came to power, nothing worried him. When it came to reading, he was not. He got knots in the middle of his stomach, and when it came to writing, he broke out into a cold sweat. And when addition was mentioned, or worse, long division, he always changed the subject right away. <laughs> Sounds a little bit like Gaston, doesn't it? But strength had never been his enemy. He could take the kick of a horse in his chest and not fall backward. He could take a hundred-pound sack of flour between his legs and scissor it open without thinking. He had once held an elephant aloft using only the muscles on his back, but his real might lay in his arms. There had never been, not in a thousand years, in arms to match Fezix, for that was his name. The arms were not only gargantuan and totally obedient and surprisingly quick, but they were also, and this is why he, he never worried, tireless. If you gave him an axe and told him to chop down a forest, his legs might give out for having to support so much weight for so long, or the axe might shatter from the punishment of killing so many trees. But Fezzik's arms would be as fresh tomorrow as today. And so, even with the Span Sicilian at his neck, the princess around his shoulders, and the Spaniard at his waist, Fezzik did not feel in the least bit put upon. He was actually quite happy because it was only when he was re requested to use his might that he felt he wasn't a bother to everybody. As he climbed arm over arm, arm over arm, 200 feet above the water, 800 feet now to go. More than, than any of them, the Sicilian was afraid of heights. All of his nightmares, and they were never far from him when he slept, dealt with falling. So this was terror, this, terrifying ascension was most difficult for him, perched as he was on the neck of a giant, or should have been, the, been most difficult, but he would not allow it. From the beginning, when as a child he realized his humped body would never conquer worlds, he relied on his mind. He trained it, fought it, brought it to heel. So now, 300 feet in the night and rising higher, while he stood while he should have been trembling, he was not. Instead, he was thinking of the man in black. There was no way anyone could have been quick enough to follow them. And yet, from, the devil's, from some devil's world, that billowing black sail had appeared. How? How? The Sicilian flogged his mind to find an answer. But he, only, but he found only failure. In wild frustration, he took a deep breath, and in spite of his terrible fears, he looked back down toward the dark water. The man in black was still there, sailing like lightning toward the cliffs. He could not have been more than a quarter mile from them now. Faster! 
the Sicilian commanded. I'm sorry, the Turk answered meekly. I thought I was going faster. Lazy, lazy, spurred the Sicilian. I'll never improve, the Turk answered. But his arms began to move faster than before. I cannot see too well because your feet are locked around my face, he went on. So could you please tell me? So could you tell me, please, if we're halfway yet? A little over, I should think, said the Spaniard from his position around the giant's waist. You're doing wonderful, Fezzik. Thank you, said the giant. And he's closing on the cliffs, added the Spaniard. No one had to ask who he was. Six hundred feet now. The arms continued to pull over and over. Six hundred and twenty feet, six hundred and fifty. Now faster than ever. Seven hundred. He's left his boat behind, the Spaniard said. He's jumped onto our rope. He's starting up after us. I can feel him, Fezzik said. His body weight on the rope. I'll never catch up, the Sicilian cried. Inconceivable! You keep using that word, the Spaniard snapped. I don't think you mean think it means what you think it does. How fast is he climbing? Fezzik said. I'm frightened, was the Spaniard's reply. The Sicilian gathered his courage again and looked down. The man in black seemed almost to be flying. Already he had cut their lead at a hundred feet, perhaps more. I thought you were supposed to be strong, the Sicilian shouted. I thought you were this might, great mighty thing, and yet he gains. I am carrying three people, Fezzik explained. He has only himself and... Excuses are the refuge of cowards, the Sicilian interrupted. He looked down again. The man in black had gained another hundred feet. He looked up now. The clifftops were beginning to come into view. Perhaps a hundred and fifty feet more, and they were safe. Hand, tied hand and foot, sick with fear, Buttercup wasn't sure what she wanted to happen. Except she knew that this much she knew. She didn't want to go through anything like it again. Fly, Fezzik! The Sicilian screamed, a hundred feet to go! Fezzik flew. He cleared his mind of everything but ropes and arms and fingers. And his arms pulled his fingers and gripped the rope and held taut and... He's over halfway, the Spaniard said. Halfway to his doom is where he is, the Sicilian said. We're fifty feet from safety, and once we're there, I'll untie the rope. He allowed himself to laugh. Forty feet. Fezzik pulled. Twenty feet. Ten. Twenty. Ten. It was over. Fezzik had done it. They had reached the top of the cliffs, and first the Sicilian jumped off, and then the Turk removed the princess as the Spaniard untied himself. He looked back down over the cliffs. Over the cliffs. The man in black was no more than 300 feet away. It seems a shame, the Turk said, looking down alongside the Spaniard. Such a climber deserves better then. He stopped talking then. The Sicilian had untied the rope from its knots around an oak. The rope seemed almost alive, the greatest of all water serpents heading at last for home. It whipped across the cliff tops, spir spiraled into the moonlit channel. The Sicilian was roaring now. And he kept it up until the Spaniard said, He did it! Did what? The humpback came scurrying to the cliff edge. Release the rope in time, the Spaniard said. See? He pointed down. The man in black was hanging in space, clinging to the sheer rock face, 700 feet above the water. The Sicilian watched fascinated. You know, he said, since I made a study of death and dying and I'm a great expert. It might interest you to know he will be dead long before he hits the water. The fall will do it, not the crash. The man in black dangled helpless in space, clinging to the cliffs with both hands. Oh, how rude we're being, the Sicilian said then, turning to Buttercup. I'm sure you'd like to watch. He then went to her and brought her, still tied hand and foot, so she could watch the final pathetic struggle of the man in black 300 feet below. Buttercup closed her eyes, turned away. Shouldn't we be going, the Spaniard asked. I thought you were telling us how important time was. It is. It is, the Sicilian said. But I just can't miss a death like this. 
I could stage one of these every week and sell tickets. I could get out of the, the assassination business entirely. Look at him. Do you think his life is passing before his eyes? That's what the books say. He has very strong arms, Fezzik commented, to hold on, for so, hold on so long. He can't hold on much longer, the Sicilian said. He has to fall soon. It was in that moment the man in black began to climb. Not quickly, of course, and not without great effort. But still, there was no doubt that he was, in spite of the sheerness of the cliffs, heading in an upward direction. Inconceivable! The Sicilian cried, and the Spaniard whirled on him. Stop saying that word! It was inconceivable that anyone could fall. But then we looked. But when we looked behind, there was the man in black. It was inconceivable that anyone could sail as fast as we could sail, and yet he gained on us. Now this too is inconceivable. But look, look! The Spaniard points down through the, through the night. See how he rises. The man in black was indeed rising. Somehow, in an almost miraculous way, his fingers were finding holds in the crevices, and he was now perhaps fifteen feet close to the top and farther from death. The Sicilian advanced on the Spaniard now, his wild eyes glittering at the insubordination. I have the keenest mind that has ever turned to unlawful pursuits, he began. So when I tell you something, it is not guesswork. It is fact. And the fact is, the man in black is not following us. A more logical explanation would be he is simply an ordinary sailor who dabbles in mountain climbing, has a hobby as a hobby, who happens to have some general, the same general final destination as we do. That certainly satisfies me, and I hope it satisfies you. In any case, we cannot take the risk of him seeing us with the princess, and therefore one of you must kill him. Shall I do it, the Turk wondered? The Sicilian shook his head. No, Fezzik, he finally he said finally. I need your strength to carry the girl. Pick her up now and let us hurry along. He turned to the Spaniard. We are heading directly for the frontier of Gilder. Catch up as quickly as you can once he's dead. The Spaniard nodded. The Sicilian hobbled away. The Turk hoisted the princess, began following the hump, began following the hump back. Just before he lost sight of the Spaniard, he turned and hollered. Catch up quickly! Don't I always, the Spaniard said. Farewell, Fezzik. Farewell, Aniga. The Turk replied, and he was gone, and the the end the Spaniard was alone. Inigo moved to the cliff edge and knelt with his customary quick grace. Two hundred and fifty feet below him now, the man in black continued his painful climb. Inigo lay flat, staring down, trying to pierce the moonlight and find the climber's secret. For a long while, Inigo did not move. He was a good learner, but not a particularly fast one, so he had to study. Finally, he realized that somehow, by some mystery, the man in black was making fists and jamming them into rocks and using them for the support. Then he would reach up with his other hand until he found a split in the rock, make another fist, and jam it in. Wherever he could find support for his feet, he would use it. But mostly, it was the jamming, it was jammed fists that made the climb possible. Nigo marveled. This was what a truly extraordinary adventurer this man in black must be. He was close enough now for Inigo to realize the man was masked, a black hood covering all of his features. Per another outlaw? Perhaps. Then why should they have to fight, and for what? Inigo shook his head. It was a shame that such a fellow must die. But he had his orders, so there it was. Sometimes he did not like the Sicilian's commands, but what could he do? Without the brains of the Sicilian, he, Inigo, would never be able to command jobs of this caliber. The Sicilian was a master planner. Inigo was a creature of the moment. The Sicilians had killed him, so why waste sympathy on the man in black? Some day, someone would kill Inigo, and the world would not stop to mourn. He stood now, quickly jumping to his feet, his thin, his body thin, sorry, his blade thin body ready. What a tongue twister. He stood now, quickly jumping to his feet, his blade thin body ready, for action. Only the man in black was still many feet away. There was nothing to do but wait for him. Nigo hated waiting. 
So to make time more pleasant, he pulled from the giant scabbard his only love, the six-fingered sword. How it danced in the moonlight. He was glorious, how glorious and true. And Nico brought it to his lips. The fervor of his great Spanish heart kissed the metal.